Hello everyone again. Um, so now let's slowly jump into a totally different area and let's speak about this, this magnificent tool creations which are purely functional data structures or purely dysfunctional and as you will probably see in a, in a second. Um, let's skip that part, you know already. So the topic for today is immutability. And in the Java space, for a very long time, I mean, especially recently, it feels like immutability is, is quite fashionable. There's a um, lot of discussions why we don't have certain things, that we don't have immutability in Java, uh, why we don't have immutable collections, and there is some pressure towards the creators of Java to, to make it happen. Well, actually we have. We have immutable collections in some minimalistic extent in the recent versions. Um, and I used to do the same, but uh, once I ended up working a bit with, with Java Slang Waiver, and actually I'm implementing one of the, one of the, the new hash map that will be in there, um, it be, started becoming quite obvious that it's not so easy, not so, not so silver bulletish as, uh, uh, as, as some of you probably think uh, it is. But before we jump straight into the, into the uh, topic, into the, the, the part where I'll we'll be, be ranting about it. Um, let's have a look at this very simple method. This is just a method called transform. It accepts a list of strings. It returns a list of strings. And what do you think? What does it do? Just based on the title and, and the types. Make immutable list. Okay, any other ideas? Transform to another form and uh, turn a new list. Okay, for example, any other ideas? Okay, so I actually did implement this one for you. Uh, so as you can see, it does quite a lot of weird stuff. So it adds something to the original list based on some internal st state, which is also a list. It adds some constant taken out of nowhere. It orders a pizza. And if there is a full moon, it removes a seven from the list. Which, by the way, is either as we probably none of us know if this is either an index or the or the actual value that needs to be removed. Um, it adds this list to some other, let's say, some local state. Um, it mutates some static field of some another class, and then returns the, the input list. Actually, so as you can see, there are sort of things that that can go wrong and can go in a very unpredictable fashion. And immutability is actually one of these tools, along with, let's say, referential transparency, that allows us to avoid being in a situation like this. Because if we have treat immutability as a, as a default, if we treat referential transparency as a default, that would be much easier to guess what this method could potentially do. Um, so if we try to get rid of the all potential um, side effects from methods that probably that, that shouldn't have them, if we could name them properly, if we use proper types, um, we could potentially, and we use immutability, which means creating new lists, we would end up with something much more predictable than what we have right now. But since we have side of common side effects, we have mutable states everywhere, static, non-static, local, a lot of implicit state, this is very hard to develop, uh, maintain, and so on. And this is where immutability kicks in. It helps us in minimizing the number of invalid states we can put our code base, our state of our application into. And let's have a look at a very simple example. Let's create a typical Java bean called user, which has mutable fields, getters and setters, and how many potentially invalid states we can come up with over here? Well, each additional setter basically exponentially kind of changes the number of invalid states we can introduce to the application. Um, so, as you can see, well, you might think that this is not something that, that's difficult to handle. Well, we can instantiate a user and remember to set free fields. Uh, it's a bit worse if you have the, such places in your code like thousands over the years. And then those small, let's say, those, those, those fractions of percent, they accumulate over time and suddenly you end up with, well, the big well of mud. 
And I'm sure you remember, if you worked with Java Util Date, how, how fun certain things were. Um, but if we, think, if we think about immutability as a first class citizen, we, we, for example, end up with something like this. We end up with a new user that has one constructor or two constructors. And now, you as a potential user, without even reading the documentation, you can create your own user by using the public API. This user is unmodifiable, so even if you tried really, really hard, you can't really break invariants of this class. Which is pretty cool, because the, the error space is reduced drastically. Because, well, there is not that much thing you can, let's say, ruin while you have, a, say, a public API, public constructor, and no immutability. Even if you want to change something with the user, let's say, you would need to create a new copy of the user containing the changes and not change the object, this one that is being passed around, let's say, the whole code base. Plus, another very cool thing about immutability is that it enables various optimizations. So, if we know that this same user is immutable with a name and surname, we could potentially memoize it. We could put it, put it in an object pool, just like we do with strings, and let's say look it up whenever we, whenever we need to. We would need to duplicate them. Plus, all like forms like hash codes, list sizes, all this stuff can be pre-computed and stored right in the object itself. Well, because if this object never changes, then the hash code will always remain the same. So you can pre-compute it, let's say, on, the, on creation, store it in a field, and then just return it because, well, it will remain constant, um, always. A quite interesting optimization, form of optimization, uh, used at least from the implementation point of view, was used even in, in Java itself. In Java 9, where we got those simple immutable data structures, with accessible through uh, static factory collection methods like list of. So, if you create a list of two elements, that you know that if you always, forever, stay a list of two elements, well, what bother, well, why bother putting an, you know, an array inside or make it a linked list, whatever? You can just use two fields. You can put two fields because the list will, can have, will always have two elements and just, and just work, your, work your way, let's say, around it just by writing some um, imperative code. So, as you can see, there's quite a lot of interesting space that application of immutability opens. But now, let's actually recall the definition of what immutable means in the, in the context of Java. And the definition is by, by Brian Getz from Java Concurrency in Practice. An object is immutable when its state cannot be modified after construction, all its fields are final, and the this reference doesn't escape the constructor during the, the, the construction. Um, Okay, so if we know this already, tell me, is string an immutable class? Are strings immutable? Who thinks that string is immutable? Okay, fair enough. Who thinks that string isn't? Okay, uh, let's, let's calibrate, the, because I've seen only half of you just uh, raising your hands. Let's calibrate the room first. Who is in the room? <laughs> okay, okay, now, now, now much easier. Um, uh, so, um, you think that string is immutable, but the definition means state cannot be modified after construction, all its fields are final, and the this reference doesn't escape during construction. So, what do you think if we look at the string implementation after Java 9? Well, look, there's a mutable field, the hash. And what? Did they, did they lie to us? And look at the hash code. Its state changes after construction, right? Because the hash is mutable, it violates one of the the, let's say three pillars of immutability according to Brian Getz, and then there is its changes after construction because the hash starts with a zero, and if not, it gets calculated later on. So, is it immutable or not? <laughs> it depends. Um, so, yeah, and actually, in our modern um, Let's say how our architecture, computer architecture is designed, computers are designed, there is no way you can have true, like, deep immutability. As long as, you know, you don't see, let's say, thousands of computers popping out of your machine, you know, every, every, every second, uh, that there is no true immutability. Somewhere deep down inside, there is, there is some mutation um, going on. So, strings are obviously immutable if we look from the, like, user's perspective. If we look for the 
eyes of the public API, for the lens of the public API, of course it behaves as an immutable class. But the layer abstraction lay lower, the way it's implemented, it can have actually some mutability inside. It's just you, as a user, you will never, never notice it. Because even you see, you can have race conditions here. If you, if you access, let's say, as a hash code from two different threads, they will to compete for this slot over there and overwrite each other. But it's safe, okay? It's a harmless race because nothing really happens because they will both overwrite with the same value. So there is quite a lot of immutability going, immutability going on inside, but you as users, you don't see it because this is encapsulated. Um, and quite a lot of immutable structures, actually, to be efficient, they will use some form of uh, internal mutability. So if the question is string mutable, we could even start asking questions if the, this does immutable even exist in, in, in our space. Well, at the end of the day, even if, if you really want to, you can take a, a string that's immutable as a user, but you can get rid of that and mess up with the internal byte array representation, really, if you want to. Yes, this code really works. Try it yourself. Um, and now here comes a very important realization. Because if immutable classes, potentially immutable, can be mutable inside, it means that Immutable objects can not always be thread safe. Well, you can, you can argue that if the implementation is flawed, it, it was never immutable. But for sure, it's a something that you need to keep into consideration when writing immutable objects. Uh, because if you play around with internals, there is some way, for example, that not all of the internals will be published to other threads in the sense of Java memory model. And this was one of the cases with Scala for a very long time. There was a bug in Scala where the, uh, let's say, empty list or like a one element vector was actually not thread safe. It was immutable, but not thread safe because other threads could, let's say, observe it in an inconsistent state because those internals that are inside, they would, uh, those fields, mutable fields were not volatile. So stuff like this happens. Um, and let's speak for a second how actually should we design our immutable APIs, you know, from the API, let's say, consumer perspective. Um, but first, so let's see how we should not do that. So what the Java Util List does, for example, it has a lot of methods like add, add all, remove, replace all. Um, and as you can see, all of them, they actually return either void, boolean, or some, some form of metadata, never a, a new new list, new, new collection. And it becomes kind of problematic, because if the base of our, let's say, one of the pillars of our language, which is a collections API, has a design done this way, well, let's say you really want to provide an immutable implementation, and there is no way you can do that in a convenient way. Because the only thing we can do is kind of block the, let's say, usage of those methods by throwing some form of exception. And this is what's happening with unmodifiable list, unmodifiable collections, and immutable collections from Java 9. So that's not ideal. It's, well, well, it's a very easy way to go forward, but it's not a very user-friendly way. Because it violates the list of substitution principle a, a bit. Because now, if you, as a consumer, you work with lists and you really want to be, let's say, 100% safe, you could probably do some instance of checks and may double check if you are working with an immutable, semi like Fox immutable uh, class or with, with the normal one. So this is not cool. Um, but the, the key to implementing user-friendly APIs of immutable structures is to actually still provide those mutable uh, methods that allow you to mutate objects. But instead of actually doing the mutation, just return a copy containing the, the actual mutated object that you want to derive from it. So this is what we could do with the Java Util List class, or in the, with the List class from List interface from the Java Collections API. We could rewrite all of them and have, let's say, them return new new objects containing those changes. And this is very convenient, very easy, much harder to make any mistakes with once you interact with it. Um, but there is a problem. There is a bit of problem with that. 
Because as you can see here, on the right side, there is copy with, copy with all, copy without, copy, copy something else. Um, and that's quite a lot of copying and iterating. Because for example, if you work with array list, you want to have a constant time access, you know, by, by indexes. And if you want to, let's say, remove an element from an array list, you expect it to be removed in a constant time. Um, but here it's not really constant time because you need to do a lot of iteration to change an object. So we lose a lot of cool properties that we had of our basic and boring mutable data structures. Plus you end up with copying quite a lot. And this is actually quite true. If you look at systems written in Haskell or something that has treats immutability very seriously, it turns out it produces quite a lot of garbage that you need to deal with which at the end of the day makes them quite not that, not that usable, let's say, if you work in performance space. There is quite a lot of mythology surrounding it, saying that runtime will optimize immutable data structures, uh, but there is, I'd like to hear a lot of examples of how it looks like, because there is actually not that much that runtime can do if it needs to just keep copying stuff all over, all over again. Well, it will deal with the problem itself, but the deficiencies are still there. I'm not saying you shouldn't use immutability, but you need to be aware of the cost and if it's worth paying it. And this is where we slowly go into the main topic of, of today, which is the persistent data structures, um, which is pretty much a solution to the problem that, that you see can see over there. The problem of immutable structures being very badly, very inefficient. So uh, from, from the memory point of view, but also from like time complexity point of view. And the persistent data structure is a structure that supports multiple versions of itself. This is when you can call something persistent. And you can achieve it in a few different ways. The first one is what we just saw, which is just a brute force copying, which means if you modify an object, you create a copy, and then you have a two versions, a previous and the current one, and the previous one remains unchanged, so it's thread safe and all that stuff. And this is by using fat nodes, uh, which means it's some form of an even sourcing done, but for data classes, uh, data structures. So imagine having a list which creates, which stores an events or some form of, let's say, comments, you know, add, remove elements, and then derives the final, let's say, version of itself by applying all of them in there. But do you see any problems with that? It's like the memory leaks on, on, uh, on request, right? It's like a constant memory leak, so it's not ideal. And the third one, this is the, the most popular, it's the structural sharing which means that we can get some efficiency by minimizing copying and maximizing reuse of existing elements. Because, right, remember, if elements don't change, if we are sure that they don't change, we can reuse what we have already. So, if we know that this is immutable, this, this structure over here, and all those elements with it are immutable as well, why not derive new structures by pointing to elements that were used already? Because, well, they can't change. And this is actually the, the idea of purely functional data structures. They actually start try to reuse as much as possible to gain efficiency. And this is where you can actually catch up quite a lot with the standard mutable data structures. Although uh, the effort to do this is quite desperate. If you go online, you can see that actually there are many, many, many let's say, sales speeches about the topic. And this one is actually very good from Oleg Shelayev, who now works for Oracle Labs. Um, but I picked this one because he presented it as those like mighty unicorn creatures, which are like a bit silver bulletish to the, to the problem. But once I started working with uh, functional data structures, I'd like to present it to a more realistic version of that, which is not cartoonish. And the realistic version of that unicorn is pretty much something like this. Um, so it's a, yeah, those are very nice, very nice concepts that look great on paper, but too bad that we need to actually run them on, existing, on, on our machines, which are not ideal. So at the end of the day, functional data structures end up being this kind of like desperate efforts trying to make them as efficient as possible. But wait, 
we spoke about this, this string, the, the immutable strings. We know they are immutable already. But is it a persistent data structure? So tell me, what happens if we call a substring method? Have you ever seen the implementation of the substring method in string? But do you remember what it does inside? Which kind of method? Okay, I will show you. Substring. Okay. So we know that the string itself doesn't change. It's immutable, right? So when we derive a, when we call a substring method, there's no point of creating a new string of a copy of it, but reuse what we have already. So as you can see, the, the new string created over there, well, it's a, it's a new object, but internally, it will have the same value as the original one. It will just store the new beginning and new index. So it will be a copy, which is effectively a view over already existing string. So, well, the same works, you know, if you look at the trim methods and others. Uh, concatenation doesn't work like this, unfortunately. Um, so it avoids new string allocations and it's quite safe because we have, I mean, we have immutability everywhere. Well, is it a persistent data structure? I mean, yes, in some points, but in general, I would say it's safe to say no, right? Um, the problem is that same kind of approach you can see in Java APIs being used on mutable structures. So there on array list, you have a method like sublist, which is pretty much the same as the same the alternate the kind of same thing that we've seen for the for the string you can derive a new list by providing a from and to indexes and just have the, the sub list of the main list and unfortunately this is this is terrible because if you use this you never return actually a copy of a list but a view over existing list and this can lead to a really really sneaky bugs so for example, in our production system, we had a component responsible for, let's say, calculating, um, um, calculating and awarding free spins to casino players. And it was a fragment of code which was apparently super tested. There was like 91% of test coverage. I was, I was assured it's, it's super tested. Don't worry, this is, one of, this is actually where we actually made a lot of effort to test stuff. I started working with it. This was kind of, kind of a, a lot of creepy legacy code uh, in that point. I tried to rework it and I reworked it and it, it worked. And it all was green. And I'm like, there's no way I didn't make any mistake in this like mutable spaghetti. So I started introducing some bugs on purpose. Well, the tests are green, okay, not cool. It turned out the test would pass always because of a combination like this. Somewhere inside the code, there was a method. Let's say we, it was an old school code using uh, Guava transformers when stream API wasn't there. Um, so there was some Guava transformer. And if you know, Guava transformers, they also don't return copies. They return views over a list that actually apply the, the method, the, 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 the mapper on the fly. So if you create a transform list using Guava Transformer, it's effectively just a view over the initial list. Then you create a sub list of this list, then you shuffle it, and it turns out that it's all in the same order, always. So you have a list which stores one single element in each node, but instead of pointing to another node, it points to another list. And this is where you end up with this recursive data structure. We just point to another list, another list, another list. What's cool in this case, you already see that you can reuse all those parts over there. Imagine you have a list of three elements. You want to add a new element to a list. Well, you don't need to copy the previous part of the list because one to three never changes. You create a new list which points to the previous list and adds the new element over there. So when you end up in this, in this recursive, recursively created data structure, and now you can fully reuse it. Because if you add an element to a list, that's a constant time, and you don't copy anything. And this is as, well, let's say, according to time complexity, is this as fast as the, the mutable, mutable counterpart. So if you can see, we create a simple list containing just one element. We create another one by prepending one element to it. So the first list will be just 
uh, is containing a zero, pointing to nil, which is like the, the sign that is the to nothing, which is one element list, effectively. And the second list has one element, but points to the first list instead, which points to a nil, which means that's the end of the list. And this is as easy as it can be. Um, so the prepend itself, as you can see, creates something called cons, in this case, at least um, the, the Scala terminology. It adds an element, creates a new cons, which is implementation of a list, which has all of this instead. So, no copying and constant time. But some of you will now notice, uh, what about if you want to append elements to this and not prepend? Because you see, it's quite convenient if you want to add an element to a list, you know, to the top of it, you know? It's worse if you want to add it from the beginning. It becomes pretty inconvenient again. Because look, what you need to do, in order to add the element to the beginning of the list, you need to actually recreate the list from scratch. You need to go, pretty much do the fold right, start with the first element, and then just keep adding, keep prepending the previous list. Oh, and this is, unfortunately, not constant time, it's linear time. Um, but generally, let's say, it's acceptable for a list, because usually we just add elements, let's say, from, from one place. So, it's kind of okay. And before we move forward, I'd like to uh, the, tackle one of the myths surrounding immutable structures. So, which is a thread safety. We already know that immutable data structures don't, don't need to provide thread safety if implementing correctly, but this is not the case. Uh, let's, see, let's assume you are talking about properly implemented immutable data structures. Um, the thing is, I often hear that this is a solution um, to a thread safety. Just go immutable, you won't have any problems because um, the stuff is immutable and you can't have multiple threads jumping in and messing up uh, with data structures. But this is a bit... It reminds me of the story of the King Midas and, and his golden touch. If you remember the story, is King Midas really wanted to have this golden touch that would allow him to touch everything and turn into gold. Too bad that the same happened to food and his relatives, water and everything else that he touched. And this is a bit the case with immutability and its thread safety. Well, immutable structures are thread safe, um, but by forbidding you to share updates. And sometimes you want to share updates. You know, it's like solving multi through you know, spreading thread safety, but telling you just use one, one thread. Okay, yes, it solved the problem, but sometimes you need to have multiple ones. And if you really want to share an update of the immutable data structures, you need to suddenly manually just grab the reference to the data list and manually control and access to it. Having a, um, so, in a very simple case, that would be just, let's say, some, uh, some reference and some synchronization done in a synchronized block. And you can already see that this will cause some major contention because you have one single contention point um, that you can't avoid. Because whenever you want to update your internal data structure and share an update, you need to have the synchronized block and all other threads just waiting for you for the result of this operation. Well, and this will be very inefficient. Imagine we could do we could do the same with a concurrent hash map. You want to have immutable hash map, um, you could have the same, you would apply the same problem, and you have one single contention point. But the cool thing about mutable concurrent hash map is that it doesn't have one single contention point. The contention is spread around on different buckets. So you can have totally two threads modifying concurrent hash map in two different, let's say, non-clashing buckets internally and have no locking at it, no contention. And you lose all of it here, because it's always one single contention point. Imagine you work with DDD, you have a very rich domain model. Let's say you have a user that contains, let's say, some, let's say some addresses, some invoices, let's say billing history. The billing history has thousands of elements, and it has a lot of properties. And you change one element of a billing history. And other friends want to change the, story, the name of a user, or someone else. And this will all, if you want to be truly mutable, it will all need to bring to one single contention point. Which is not really cool. So, maybe, maybe, if you really want to share updates, maybe just use dedicated mutable data structure that, that's thread safe. Maybe it will be much easier, much more efficient. 
Or maybe share updates in a totally different way. Maybe just maybe it's worth instead of sharing memory, you can actually send messages around and use message passing to inform about updates happening. Um, and this the same principle applies to any immutable data structure. So imagine you want to have a shared string and have multiple threads appending to it. You need to do the same. You need to have some volatile string over there, um, and then synchronize method that would let's say append let's say new version of a string to it. So this is a common issue. And now imagine that instead of going synchronized, we go with compare and swap and log free program. So we end up with the same case. Imagine we have 1,000 threads trying to modify one shared string, or one string with data structure that has millions of elements. Only one will succeed at a time, and other 1,000 threads will need to discard their objects and throw it to the garbage collector, which is a huge stress. Um, so this is terrible, actually, if you start thinking about this. It's terribly inefficient. So once we went oh, through this, Let's actually have a look at how you can implement a persistent set. Um, the thing with sets is that, well, you already know one way of implementing them. Persistent persistence for data structures, which would be just having the least internal. But when can we do something smarter than that? Keep in mind that I said smarter and not better. There's a lot of smart things we can do around that. So we could use a tree. We could use a tree-based structure. If you, know, if you look at trees, they are actually quite suitable for similar things that, you do, that we did with the list itself. Because, well, effectively, it's, it's recursive as well. Because, you see, this is a tree, 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 and this is a tree, right? So there is some form of... Um, um, recursiveness, um, recursion and um, persistence that we can play around with here. But there's one problem. Imagine that we want to add one element to, uh, to, a, to, to a tree. Let's say you want to add a 42 and look, it goes over here. But we can't really reuse all of that. Right? Because if you think about recursiveness, the recursion goes towards the root, not towards the towards leaves. Okay? Because you add the first element here, you add second, you add third, fourth. But this, all along the way, you need to copy. Right? So you, we already are in a place that if we want to provide a better time complexity and better e efficiency, we already need to have some form of compromise because we, we can't have full structure sharing. Because in order, if we want to have a tree, we will need to copy always the path that leads to the last added element. And we can reuse only those all over there. Obviously, as the tree grows, grows bigger, this becomes a bit more, let's say, the, the, the value of that becomes much more e visible. Because you have, this one can be fully, you see, it's fully reused. This can be reused. And if you add 13, you just copy it up the root. So the copying is only this, but we still have quite a lot of structural sharing that we can reuse. So we know already how we can play around with lists, how we can play around with trees, uh, sets uh, implemented on the base of a trees. What can we do if we wanted to implement a queue? How do you think so? Well, we could use a list, right? Because, well, linked list it actually implements an interface queue. Uh, but it works really good as a stack because you, if you add elements from one side and take from one uh, side this will work really really good uh, but the way we interact with queues is a bit different because we put elements from one side and put from the other so that's not so cool because we would what we would need to do right here is always have constant time let's say append I mean constant time take and linear time let's say put from from the other side which is not ideal. Um, so what we could do here is, well, is try to think about the, defini the definition of a persistence and think of what you know so far and try to come up with the dumbest possible solution that works. Well, 
We know that lists are very efficient, uh, persistent lists are very efficient where you add only from one side elements, but very inefficient if you take from the other side. Well, let's just put two lists together, but reversed. And you end up with uh, something that gives you a constant time access from both sides. Well, almost. Um, and now, if you have a look how it, how it looks like, if you create a new list, well, you just need to remember that in some very strategical moment, you need to reverse one of the lists and concatenate with, with the first one. Because, well, if you run out of elements in one list, well, it's not ideal, okay? Because, well, they, you still want to access them. So, the trick is that at some point, you need to reverse elements and move them from one queue to another. So, the end queue operation is just prepended from the, you know, one, uh, prepend only add element to one list that's in the front. And if you deck you, um, you do a bit, you take it from, um, from, from the other one. Um, but here's the problem. So I told you that it's Amor, that this is constant time operation. Well, it's almost, because it's something like amortized constant time, which means it's constant time, but not really. So if you look at uh, common access patterns, you will see that most operations will be done in constant time, except for the case where we need to actually uh, reverse one of, the, one of the lists. This is where the linear time kicks in. But it's okay, because it's, let's say, exponentially, it happens exponentially infrequent in comparison to the normal access patterns. So you can do some black, black maps there and kind of distribute this, 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 this ON over time and over different, uh, and ON01 accesses and it's amortized constant time, which means that expected is constant, but pessimistic is linear. Um, but this kind of, this means that we have unpredictable latency because sometimes we can just have it done very fast and sometimes we need to well, reverse a list which will be much slower than what we have when it's constant time. And again, could we do something smarter than that? Well, we could use a tree again. One of the interesting concepts that actually are used, which allows you to get this ideal queue, is the concept of two, three, three, which means that there is a tree that has uh, all elements at one level, um, and it has always two or three branching from each, each stage. Um, but you might be thinking, okay, we have a tree, but we still need constant time access to the front and the back of the queue. So what can we do? We can grab those elements over there and pull them up to the root itself. And the data structure ends up looking a bit like this. So this is the root of the two free finger tree. And those points here are called fingers. So you have an access, a linear, a constant time access to the beginning and to the end. It becomes a bit more harder if you go down deeper, if you need to access others, and if you want to modify them. But again, you'll end up with something that's with some form of amortized constant time. And this is like the as ideal as it can get when it comes. Um, but the question is, if this is so smart, why does Scala and many other languages actually use bunkers queue? Why do you think? It turns out that although we came up with a super smart solution with the ideal implementation of a persistent queue, uh, but it's very, very cache unfriendly. Let's have a look at this again. Um, do you remember how, you, have you ever tried comparing linked list to array list and see how less efficient it gets because of, because of the old cache unfriendliness it provides? Usually when you play with linked list, it's inefficient because all, you, when you chase pointers to next nodes, in most cases, those will be a cache miss, CPU cache misses. If you have everything in one array, there usually will be some form of prefetching, and those elements that are next to it will end up being in a cache, and effectively being much more faster than, than, than a linked list. This is the same case here, just worse, because usually, in linked list, you need to do just one pointer tracing. If you want to access the next element, well, you go one pointer further. And here you jump, you do a few jumps if you need to. 
So this can be really, really inefficient. And it turns out that a simpler solution actually works better. It's more, more, much more effective. You store, you use less memory and it's much faster. This is why Scala doesn't have this two three finger tree implementation, uh, but just um, but just those simple just dump solution with putting two lists together. Um, and this is how we go to persistent map, which is probably one of the smartest thing you can you can see when it comes to dealing with data structures in general. Well, you can go for implement it very easily. Something that will be correct. Well, just put a list with entries. Right, but you already know it's well. It works. Again, it's super inefficient because well, you have lin linear access to elements, which is pretty sad. Could we do something smarter than that? App tries come into into play. Um, for those of you that don't remember what a try is, try itself is a concept of a radix tree, where which allows you to store. Um, let's say some sequences and manage and store them by storing fragments of their prefixes, of known prefixes. So look, imagine we have, we want to store all those words along with prefixes in a try data structure. So what happens? You store, you see a shared, shared prefixes in each node and this is how you build the whole word. So you see, if you want to st store a, tr a T word, you go T, E, A, T. But if you want to store TED, you go T, E, and D. Do you see what I mean? You see, you can see there's quite a lot of potential for reuse when it comes to the structure. And if you ever used Google or something like this, probably somewhere there inside they have some form of similar mechanism which allows you to effectively, let's say, go through some prefix-based searches. And this is where hash array, uh, hash array mapped try comes into the place. Um, this concept is really kind of difficult, so don't worry if you don't get this, but I wanted to be aware how much effort it needs to be put in to make this, make this efficient. So hash array mapped try basically is a persistent try which stores hash codes and hash sequences. So in order to Im I imitate the way the hash map works, we will use the same concept as here, but instead of storing just random, random words, we will always store hash codes, which will be encoded in some, some fixed length bit sequ sequences. And, and once we have those bit sequences, in each of the nodes, we can have an array containing pointers to another nodes in there. Um, and usually those form of um, hash array map tries, they will always be, let's say, fixed, uh, fixed depth. And we'll have a very huge branching factor, which means each of the nodes will probably store around 32 elements. Each element can have 32 children. And now, you can do quite efficient lookups using hash codes of those elements. You have a tree structure, which means you can reuse quite a lot again. Um, some of you might notice that, well, if we, have a, if we have an almost empty hash map containing a lot of elements, there will be a lot of empty space along in there. Well, this is where people came up how to deal with the problem. Um, since everything is immutable, you can actually not, you can skip all those elements and store in arrays only elements that are present, but then store a separate bitmap that, that tells you which elements are actually in the internal array. So it gets pretty complicated. But wait, I told you that it gives a constant time access to elements, but there is a tree. So, and the accesses patterns in trees are a bit different than than constant time. But if you wanted to calculate the time complexity of this one, this is logarithms of base 32 of n elements that are being stored in there. Um, but think about this. 32 branching factor, six or seven, let's say, levels of a tree. So what kind of a big value do we end up with? How many elements we can store? Quite a lot. So if you calculate the 
log 32 from max value of integer, it's 6. It's 6, okay? So it's not constant time. It just effectively, by having this limitation of the size, we know that there will be max 6 hops, which is, which is constant time, just very slow. So it's a slow constant time in comparison to others. And to, to give you a comparison, if you put a long max value in there, which is like, whoa, much bigger than that, it's only 13 hops. So this is, this is pretty much const, constant time, effectively. Ah, but it turns out that well, we still have quite a lot of pointer chasing, we have a lot of hops to be made, and this is where something like compressed array mapped prefix tree comes in. And this is a new Scala's hash map since the 2.13. So in order to avoid having this data structure, people are playing around, for example, with, with not having a tree at all, but having, for example, one huge, uh, huge array that kind of Im imitates uh, a tree, which is, a, which is a, physically it's an array, but logical tree. Another idea is trying to um, go into that by store, by, and store two different arrays with different organized elements. I don't really fully understand how, how the implementation that's now in Scala works. It's a very, very fresh thing. But it's getting quite intense. Um, so, but the concept itself is quite good, quite interesting. So if you go and see, let's say, what Martin Oderski came up with, there are papers like cache aware log free concurrent hash tries, uh, which provide, let's say, the same ideas, but in a mutable versions for cache aware and very efficient concurrent well, structures imitating hash maps using this way. So as you can see, there is so much, let's say, um, so much thinking, so much science into this to make it you know, as, as usable, as efficient, as well, as a simple, let's say, common mutable hash map. So this is kind of scary. And that's the main message for today, what I'd like to show you. I wanted to show you to make you aware that immutability is, does give you a lot of benefits, but you need to be aware of the cost that, that, that someone needs to pay, or pe mostly people that implement it, um, to make it barely as efficient as the mutable counterparts. And don't be afraid of mutability, because it has, again, it has its own context where it works much better than immutable ones. Um, if you'd like to play around with Immutable data structures with persistent data structures. You have Waver or X Java slang, where it's implemented pretty well. And I'm actually playing around with the with the concept of uh, compressed hash array map tries. So I hope that till the end of the holiday of the vacation, I want to, if you don't know which one to try, try Waver, because it follows the conventions known in Scala. So if you jump into Scala later on, you'll see something very familiar, very familiar APIs. Cyclops takes, let's say, its own opinionated way into persistent data structures. Um, so that would be all for today. And what I'd like you to remember about is that having efficient immutability involves quite a lot of acrobacy. And it's all based on min minimization of copying and maximization of structural sharing. Um, at the end of the day, we also see that the simple solutions often beat much smarter and complex ones regarding at least complexity. Those nice, perfect, ideal models that looked great on paper, they don't look that good on, uh, they, they don't run that good, because at the end of the day, there is some dumb piece of electronics that needs to actually execute one of those models that looks great on paper. Immutability is, as you can see, not a silver bullet. There are much many use cases for simple, mutable, uh, data structures. And remember that trade-offs are pretty much everywhere. So once you understand what, what, what's behind all of that, now you should be able to make a conscious choice where to go into it, where it will bring you actual value and not punish you for doing that. If you want to experiment a bit more, you can have a look at those few ideas. Um, one, probably one of the most interesting ones that I'd like you to have a look at is the last one. It's an article from Alexei Shipilev about garbage collection and locality. We mentioned a little bit of cache locality, or locality of reference today. And it turns out that actually, in order to make things faster, when playing around with present data structures is 
to have a garbage collector that actually does compaction. Because all those structures like two free finger trees, finger finger trees, well they are very inefficient because of very bad cache locality. Um, because of the indirection. Imagine now what happens if you have multiple threads allocating objects on the heap. They will allocate it in pretty much like random fashion. Those objects from multiple data structures will, let's say, intertwine each other on the heap, right? But imagine that we don't use one of these objects anymore. This is where the garbage collection kicks in. It swipes out those elements and now performs a compaction, which effectively brings those elements closer and closer together. And this is a fantastic realization you can make that moving GCs that do compactions can actually improve performance of your application and not degrade it because of the cache friendliness they, they introduce by bringing things closer together. Wow. So thank you very much. That, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed those two totally unrelated topics of today. Um, I'm a, I'm a lead software engineer for Customotech. I do trainings for Bottega. I'm on Twitter. If you want slides, they are here and we have some time for questions. Thank you.